Well, hello everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome back to our second session here in lectures that I hope will blow your mind anyway. And um, let me just say thanks again f to everybody who's been here uh, last time and we'll be here again tonight. Uh, please, thanks again for donating. We've raised $2,371 so far for the Food Bank of Delaware. It is absolutely not necessary for you to donate to be part of this. We're Everybody is welcome. And um, we... Uh, not necessary for you to donate to be part it, it, don't feel obligated to donate more than once if you've already donated and don't feel obligated to donate at all we're just glad to have everybody here with us um, so uh, even though as the Tao Te Ching says those who know don't speak and those who speak don't know here we are anyway and so we're going to talk about that we're going to speak about that and of course that's generally one of the passages I try to ignore because I earn my living by speaking uh, but uh, today we are going to be diving into a little bit of the deep end because um, we're going to be talking about Taoist metaphysics and so the question is what is metaphysics and we'll talk about that but let me begin by emphasizing and those of you who've been in my classes or had these conversations with me before know that I'm basically what I could call a Nagarjunian or a Wittgensteinian in the sense that w w to me philosophy is only ever talking about words so when we talk about m normally for I think for some metaphysicians for some metaphysicians some philosophers metaphysics is describes reality but metaphysics is about reality when we do metaphysics we're talking about reality but when I, when I do metaphysics we're talking about a way of talking about reality we're trying to come up with a language that we can use to talk about reality in a way that's meaningful and that does not exceed the limits of language which I think often metaphysical language does it makes claims it refers to things that are not part of actual reality uh, and because we have a word for it we tend to think we have a thing that corresponds to the word so uh, so when we talk about metaphysics then let me be clear that uh, metaphysics is about reality is the branch of philosophy that asks questions about reality and so again everything that we're going to be saying here is about the language that we use to talk about reality I'm never making claims about reality uh, and so to talk about what metaphysics means again in the broadest sense it refers to questions about what it means to say things are real so when we one way to distinguish between physics and metaphysics is to suggest that physics describes the operation of real things describes the behavior and interactions of real things whereas metaphysics asks the question what does it mean to say they're real so when you say that this is a real desk what is it what does the concept of reality add to the concept of the desk what is it what does it mean to say that the desk is real so different traditions different philosophers have different answers and there's about as many answers as there are philosophers but I and and within Taoism within modern Taoist studies and I'm going to trace that pretty far back within Mao, da, modern Taoist studies uh, I think we're going to find um, at least two major disagreements a, a major disagreement between two different views regarding what we mean by reality so what I'm getting at here then is uh, basically a, cr a critique of the conventional way of understanding Taoism and I think most people who have read a book on Taoism or have read a translation of the Tao Te Ching have seen the description of the Tao and the Tao with a capital T or D and with the word the in front of it now one thing you want to remember is that the none of that takes place in Chinese there's no the there's so there's no way to say the Tao there's no capital letters there's no plurals or singulars so when we use the character Tao it's not at all clear whether we're talking about a Tao, the Tao, some Tao's, all Tao's or whatever 
So that's one disagreement I'm going into this with. The, the conventional reading, and I'll call it the conventional reading for now. Uh, we're going to end up calling it the ontological reading. Uh, but for now, we're going to call it the tr conventional reading because I would say probably 90% of scholars still, I think, uh, have adopted this view. But that is, I think, gradually changing. So this is going to be in some ways contrary to the way most treatments present this and the way most translations present this. So the what we're calling, so we're talking about different ways of basically interpreting or translating the book that we're calling the Tao Te Ching. The Tao Te Ching is the central text of philosophical Taoism for sure, even though there are many other texts. Uh, and next time we will talk about more about the text itself and another Taoist text, the Zhuangzi. But for now I want to focus on two major readings of the idea of Tao, what the word Tao means. Because the word Tao, and we talked about this last time, generally refers to how things work, how to do things, the way things go. Maybe there's a moral implication or a normative implication of it being the right way, but it definitely comes to take on a metaphysical meaning, a way of describing reality. So people talk about the Tao as though it's some type of reality, and we're going to press that in a moment or two. So this is what we're getting at today, is different readings of the word Tao and what it means metaphysically. The Tao Te Ching comes into existence probably somewhere, it's some form of it, or maybe multiple forms of it, are in existence by around, let's say, 450 BCE. Uh, it is edited and compiled uh, late, much later uh, in the form that we have it now, uh, probably as late as maybe 2 or 250 BC, uh, 2 or 250 CE by the editor and, and commentator Wang Bi. Um, so, uh, so it's it's been around for quite some time, and. Uh, I do think that by the time of Wang Bi, who is this major commentator and editor of the text, it has taken on a metaphysical tone. Because by that time, we've got Buddhism taking root in China. We've got other forms of philosophical thought challenging for supremacy in the philosophical marketplace. So there's a lot going on. There's a lot of competition. And so uh, Taoism tends, takes on this very metaphysical turn. Question. Sound difficulties. Sound just got low. Are we back? Sorry, everybody. Okay. How about now? I don't think so. Um, we're trying to find another microphone to use. We got the team working day and night. Better. Better. We're getting better. Every day in every way, we're getting better and better. Better now. Hello, you all. Okay, great. So I'm going to keep going. I'm not sure. Where, do you have any idea where it was when I stopped or when, when people lost me? Okay. Uh, so, wh what we're getting at then is uh, different ways of defining the word Tao as a metaphysical term. And by the 2nd, 3rd century CE in China, people are stopping okay now. People, okay, okay. So uh, by the by the second or third century, people are introducing metaphysical themes. I think that's where I left this off. So the question is, is how is Tao a description of reality? And I do think to some extent that the transition to metaphysics can be blamed on Wang Bi, but the introduction of what I'm calling the ontological reading, I think that can be traced to more modern sources when the Europeans first discovered these materials and first translated them. It's pretty clear that when the German idealists first came along texts like the Tao Te Ching, they had already been familiar with Hindu texts such as the texts from Advaita Vedanta, the Upanishads, the Vedas, and they assumed that all Asian thought was the same, 
So they were looking for very similar concepts in the Tao Te Ching, and certainly if you're looking far enough into the Tao Te Ching, you'll probably find anything. So, um, so the fact is that this conventional reading, this ontological reading, ontology is the branch of philosophy that asks questions about being and existence. So the ontological reading is, understands the idea of Tao as a fundamental reality, pretty much like a god, if we were thinking theologically, or Brahman in Advaita Vedantic terms, some type of abstract fundamental reality. So the, the traditional understanding of Tao as the Tao, with capital letters, is a monolithic Tao. That means it's singular. There's the Tao. It's also fundamentally real. Everything else that's real depends on it. It's the source of everything that's real. It's ontologically prior to the world. The world emerges out of it. And it's the, in that sense, it's the first cause of the world, which raises, of course, pr logical problems of infinite regress. Where did that come from and where did that come from? It's also understood to be transcendent. That's to say, Tao is not in the world. It's somehow outside of, behind, underneath the world. It's also abstract. In fact, like the Advaita Vedantic Brahman, it's utterly abstract. There's nothing you can point to as an example of it. And that's why I think it's rendered with the capital T when we, or D, when we capitalize terms in that way, we generally turn them into abstractions. And also, one last feature of this ontological Tao is that it's ineffable. There's nothing that we can say about it. Uh, in fact, the, the most common translation of the first line of the Tao Te Ching is something along the lines of, the Tao that can be spoken of is not the true Tao. And if, there is, if the Tao that can be spoken of is not the true Tao, then first of all, there is a true Tao, and it can't be spoken of. So this is very much, I think, akin to these Vedantic ideas of Brahman or Kabbalistic ideas of Ein Sof, of some absolute that can't be described in words. And so we end up getting this, this language that the Tao that can be told is not the eternal Tao. And that is such a common translation of the first line of that text. So what I've pointed out now is, is the is what I'm calling the ontological reading, which is still, I think, the standard reading uh, in, among scholars today, um, which is that Tao refers to a monolithic, fundamental reality that's ontologically prior to the world as the first cause. It's also transcendent to the world. It's not present in the world. It's also static. It doesn't change. It's called the eternal Tao. And remember now, eternal means outside of time because it's not changing. It's abstract and it's singularly ineffable. Apparently everything else can be talked about, but not the Tao, okay? And I am going to argue against that reading, okay? And I'll begin by emphasizing the reasons why I, why I reject that reading, and then I will add my own reading, uh, what, I, what I'm gonna propose as an alternative, which we're gonna call the process reading which is a dynamic reading. So I have at least three sets of reasons why we want to reject the ontological reading of the concept of Tao. There are historical reasons, there are linguistic reasons, and there are philosophical reasons. The historical reasons are, are pretty straightforward. There's absolutely no evidence of that kind of abstract metaphysics in Chinese thought at that time. That kind of abstract thinking gets imported with Buddhism that brings in the sophistication of Hindu abstract thought. But again, as we emphasized last time, in the earlier context, the, um, the meeting of Tao was totally practical and concrete. How do I make it better? How do I do this? What's the right way to do this? As opposed to some kind of metaphysical question of what is it? And that kind of question gets asked much later after the introduction of Buddhism and other forms of abstract thinking. Because by that time, the Chinese are already on the Silk Route and there's all kinds of other thought entering into China. Uh, so I do think that historically that, again, as I said, between Buddhism, Wangbi, the Silk Route, the German idealists, 
I think that ultimately what we end up with is a superimposed reading. As I'll point out, I think that we get a lot of translator imposition in these ontological readings that dramatically changes what the text probably would have meant at the time. And I am not pretending to have some kind of special access to what Lao Tzu really meant or what the text really means, but I do think there are good sound reasons to rule out certain possibilities for how the text may have been received at the time. Uh, and I do think that we're not limited to reading the text the way it was read at the time, but I do think it's important to have access to that. And anything else, like Stephen Mitchell's translation of the Tao Te Ching, which is virtually has no relationship to the text whatsoever, it's, they shouldn't be calling out a translation of the Tao Te Ching. That should be somebody's own philosophy inspired by the Tao Te Ching. Uh, sorry, but my bitterness towards Stephen Mitchell is coming out. Uh, I'll have to rein that in. Um, so, let's be clear then. Th th those are the historical reasons why I'm rejecting it. There's no contemporary thought at the time that deals with those kinds of questions. Uh, linguistically, there are so many reasons why we should reject the idea of this metaphysical ontological Tao. This, these include the fact that the, ch the Chinese language lacks many features which are usually associated with grammar. As we said before, there's no parts of speech, there's no singulars or plurals, no tense, no gender, no definite, indefinite articles, and so on and so forth. So there's no grammatical distinction between nouns and verbs, so it, it would be as correct to say that things happen as it would be to say that things exist. And this notion of existence is difficult to sustain in Chinese. In fact, there is no Chinese word, modern or ancient Chinese, for, ex for, the, word, for the verb to be. There is no Chinese equivalent of the verb to be. There are Chinese words that take the place of that term in, in certain types of contexts and certain syntactical markers and things like that. But, the, but there's no way to describe that kind of static metaphysics in Chinese. Things don't exist. They happen. So in Chinese, you wouldn't say that the cup... In English, if you wanted to describe the, the location of a cup, you would say the cup is on the table. And what you're really doing is you're modifying the concept of is, the, the idea of the existence of the cup is taking place on the table. But in Chinese, there's no verb to be. So Instead, you would either say the cup resides on the table, or you would say the surface of the table has the cup, but you, but you wouldn't be making a statement about the existence of the cup. You're able to express a similar meaning, but not in terms of existence. So we don't, that may, that's a really big problem, is the lack of, of a static grammar, the idea of being, the idea that the, that the language can even that the idea that the language can't even describe a static metaphysics at all. Uh, and the idea of eternality, right? The idea that, uh, that things are eternal uh, and that, uh, or that the Tao is eternal, which means it's outside of time entirely. You get no such notion there. I will argue against that when we talk about what word is being translated as eternal. And there are also philosophical reasons to, to re reject the ontological reading. For instance, the objection to the idea of a first cause, the infinite regress that that results in. If there's a first cause, where did that come from? Where did that come from? Uh, and in fact, in this text, that causality seems to move in both directions. It specifically says in the Tao Te Ching that reversal is the movement of the Tao. It goes out and it comes back, and it goes out and it comes back. The principle of Tai Ji, yin and yang. It goes out and it comes back. So this notion of eternality is completely inconsistent with what is the dominant, what seems to be the dominant metaphysics in ancient China, which is a dynamic metaphysics, a metaphysics of change, a metaphysics of flux and flow. Even the so-called five element theory in Chinese thought is actually not elements. Elements represent these kind of static elements in Greek thought. But in Chinese thought, the word is xing, which means a phase or a movement of some kind. So Chinese metaphysics is totally dynamic. It is not static. And um, I'm going to object to that all along. And I also will show that I think that the ontological reading makes the text seem very obscure and uh, makes it seem as though 
there's a lot of non sequiturs or things that things that don't follow from what precedes it huge leaps uh, in the ideas in the text and I think that when we read the text through a process reading we cut down dramatically on the, the number of non sequiturs and logical inconsistencies and so we will um, see how that works as we proceed but um la di da so uh, how are we doing? Any major questions that need to be answered before I keep going? All right. So what I want to talk about now then, we've talked about the ontological reading, and let me just remind you that in the ontological reading, Tao is um, monolithic, fundamentally real, transcendent, static, abstract, and ineffable. And now we're talking about the process reading. And again, we're translating the word Tao as process. Now the word Tao is the first article, the first character on the handout that I gave out, which is located, the link to that is located at the bottom of this YouTube uh, site here, so you should be able to find it on the page somewhere if you don't have it yet. But the word Tao is the first character on that list, and as we mentioned last time, it seems to suggest the way the leader walks, which would indicate the right way or a good way, but it does suggest movement. And I think it's very much opposed to the, the standard ontological static reading. So the qualities of the process Tao, as, a, as opposed to the ontological Tao, are that, first of all, here we're talking about a pluralistic Tao. There are many Tao's. There are, an, and I'll say later on, there are an infinity cubed number of Tao's. And I know that the notion of infinity cubed is absurd, but there's a reason for putting it that way. But so there's an, there's an infinite number of Tao's, uh, all Taoing simultaneously. And again, because there's no difference between nouns and verbs, I can put it either way, and I'm going to put it both ways so that we can start to break down, I think, the barrier between seeing Tao as a noun and Tao as a verb. So uh, Tao's are pluralistic. Tao's are real. Tao's are real things but they're not fundamentally real. Whereas again, in the ontological reading, Tao is fundamentally real, it's uniquely real. Tao's in, in, the, in the process sense are characteristically real, they're universally real. Everything is equally real in some sense or another. All Tao's are real Tao's. So there's no fundamental reality, but there is reality. It's, this notion of Tao is also dynamic, it's active, it's moving, it's proceeding through time. It's also concrete, not abstract. The actual things in the world that we can touch, that we interact with, that we can see, those are real things. Those are Taoists. Those are Taoings in some sense or another. And, um, and Tao's actually Tao. And, there are, and also we can say that process Tao's are also ineffable. That's to say Tao's are also ineffable, but generally ineffable, universally ineffable, not uniquely ineffable. In other words, all Tao's are, are incapable of being captured precisely in language. All Tao's escape that kind of precision. So that, let's be clear, there's no word that you could use that would substitute for the experience of seeing, smelling, tasting, touching a, a rose. No word captures the object. Words refer, but they don't, they don't substitute for. So in that sense, then, um, Dao, all Tao's are at least somewhat ineffable, but no Tao is uniquely ineffable in that sense. So, yes, question. How analogous is Tao as process to Praticca Samutpada? Well, as some of you know, Praticca Samutpada is a Buddhist context is a Buddhist concept of interdependent origination. Now, all dharmas, all, all things that can be said to be real, simultaneously participate in causal relations with everything else that can be said to be real. And I do think that that's very similar to what we're talking about here, uh, in, in certain senses. I think the emphasis is going to be different, because I, I think in, in the Buddhist sense, the emphasis is to break down a concept of a, of a monolithic self, of an autonomous self. And I think that that's not the goal in, in Taoism. So I do think that the, metaphysic, that the two views are going to be seen to be very similar. 
but they're not the same and they're not coined for the same purposes, I think. So, uh, and maybe we'll come back and, and later on and show how they're similar because that's a really good question because I think wherever we see these kinds of similarities, especially between things like Buddhism and Taoism, but then we also want to make sure we look for differences too because they're not exactly the same. So, so um, let's press on then. Um, <clears throat> so, Daos are processes and that's how I'm translating the word Tao then. And I like, I like that word process here because the word process can, mean a, can be a noun or a verb. Again, processes proceed, process, that's what they do. And to describe things as processes, again, is to emphasize that they occur rather than exist. Things move through time, they change. And no matter how slowly they change, they're changing. Some things change more quickly than others, and we'll talk later about why. And some things change very slowly, but everything is changing and everything is flowing through time. So that's why I like the word process and process to translate the word Tao. But when we talk about how many Tao's make up the universe, I use the phrase an infinity cubed. And I'm going with that, I'm gonna stick with that. And the reason is, is because if we think of any individual process, like imagine alanine here. Alanine is a, is a process that's, going, that's proceeding here. And there are a virtually infinite number of other things in the universe, like alanine, other objects in the physical universe. So there are, mil there are an infinite number of Tao's, but within this Taoing, which we're calling Alan, there are a virtually infinite set of sub Taoings going on. I have organic processes going on. Within the organic processes going on, we have cellular processes. We have in monocellular processes. We have metabolic processes. We have elect molecular processes, atomic processes, subatomic processes, ad infinitum. There's absolutely no limit to how small it gets. It just gets to a certain point where it's just not worth talking about anymore. And similarly, this processing that we're calling alanine is taking place within an increasingly macrocosmic set of processes as well. So we're part of this conversation right now, which is part of a lecture series, which is part of, of, a, of a summer, which is part of a lifetime, which is part of a historical era, part of a cosmic epoch and ad infinitum the only limit is at what point it stops being even remotely relevant. So that's what it means to see that there are an infinity cube number of Dowings in the physical universe. There are an inf infinity number of things, each of which contains an infinity number of processes, each of which is contained within an infinity number of processes. And so the universe is buzzing with processes. It's just overwhelmingly crowded in here, okay? So with that distinction in mind, with that idea of the universe as this buzzing, teeming swarm of processes, we can make another distinction. And I think this distinction may account for some of the wrongheaded, I'll go ahead and say wrongheaded metaphysics of the ontological view. That is to say, I'm gonna make a distinction here between two senses of the word Tao that seem to show up in the Tao Te Ching. One sense of the word is the ideal sense. Tao is in the ideal sense. And the other is Tao's in the actual sense, actual Tao's. Now, as I'll, say, as I'll show, I think that these terms are equivocated. That, in other words, the term Tao is used, but sometimes it's used in one way, and sometimes it's used in another way, and as a result, it's not always clear what it means. And I think that if you insist that it only means one thing, then half the time it's not going to make any sense. So I think once we disambiguate that equivocation, once we clarify the, the exact nature of that equivocation, which sense of the word is being used in which case, then I think we can account for much of the, I think, non sequitur reading of the Tao Te Ching that we find in the ontological view. So when we talk about an ideal Taoing, let's begin by defining the word ideal. And there are at least three senses of the word ideal that I want to exploit here. One is the idea of perfection. 
The ideal is the perfect in the technical sense, lacking nothing, with no flaws, no blemishes, complete, perfect in that sense. So the ideal is the perfect, but it's also unattainable for reasons that we'll talk about later. It, and, but instead of calling it, instead of calling the ideal unattainable, I'm going to describe it as asymptotic. In calculus, the asymptote is the line that a curve approaches but never quite reaches. So I'm calling this ideal asymptotic in the sense that we'll never quite get there, but we can get closer and closer. And in fact, that would be a reason to talk about the ideal is so that we can get closer and closer to it even though we might not ever quite get there. And the third sense of ideal that I want to exploit here besides perfect and asymptotic is normative. That it, it's something we should or ought to try to, to accomplish. It's, we're trying to achieve the ideal. We should, ought to try to achieve the ideal. So, it, so in that sense, <clears throat> let's be clear, the ideal Tao is a hypothetical Tao. Now why? Why is it, so let, let's think of it this way. If, let's imagine that I am, and I'm not, I'm not bragging, let's imagine that I am a, an Olympic champion archer and a Nobel Prize winning physicist. So if I'm at an archery meet and I'm standing 100 meters away from the target, I, because I'm a world-class physicist, I can calculate in my head exactly the, the ideal trajectory of the arrow from the bow to the bullseye. I can calculate the, uh, the exact arc it would have to take. I can calculate the exact force that would have to go into the arrow to make it go that way. The exact altitude and attitude and everything else. I can figure all that out in my head perfectly because I'm a world-class physicist and I can do exactly what I wanted to do because I'm a world-class athlete. So I figure it out exactly, I shoot it exactly right, and I still don't hit the bullseye exactly in the center. And the question is why? And the answer is, something's gonna get in the way. A breeze, gravity waves, a poor bird, whatever. And don't worry, no birds were actually harmed in the making of this example. But something's gonna get in the way. Some unknown variable, some hidden variable is going to interfere. And the question is, why is that inevitable? Why can there be no uninterrupted, uninterfered with DAOs? And the answer is, we mentioned a second ago, there are an infinity cubed number of DAOs going on. So everything's interfering with everything else all the time. Everything is interfering with everything else all the time. Though the only reason you can see me is because light is bouncing off of me. The only reason you can hear me is because sound is bouncing off of your eardrums. Everything's interfering. I'm displacing air as I sit here. Everything is interfering with everything all the time. This is another place where it starts to sound a little bit like Pratichi Samupada. Shout out to the Martian Manhunter over there. Okay. So, um, so, the fact is, the ideal DAO is purely hypothetical. Ideal DAOs refer to how DAOs would DAO if they experienced no interference, but every actual DAO in the actual world experiences interference. So the concept of an ideal DAO is a counterfactual. It's how the world, it's how things would be if the world were other than it is. But the world is this way, and so if there were a DAO that would be completely uninterfered with, it would have to exist in a universe all by itself. It would have, try to imagine a universe where only this pen exists in the whole universe, floating around all by itself. It's, it's absurd, obviously. So it makes no sense to conceive of that. So the question, yeah. Zeno's paradox. Well, again, Zeno's paradox, right. So all that means is, is that you can keep cutting it up into smaller and smaller pieces. And that's a logical problem. In reality, it, there are no pieces that it actually gets cut up into. So that's why calculus always approximates the curve, but never actually curves. The same way 
movies, or at least film, approximates motion but never quite moves. And, and I think the same thing applies to Zero's Paradox. It just plays on the fact that calculus is not reality. Uh, but anyway, uh, coming to the second question, I would say that I wouldn't call the ideal Tao an Ubermensch because an Ubermensch is a person, a, an overperson. Nietzsche's idea of the person who overcomes himself. But if you want to link these ideas together, the Ubermensch or the, or the person who is a, a self-actualized or self-realized person would be a person who, in terms of their own lifestyle and course of their life, was dowing as close to the ideal as possible. And that's what we're getting to. So, with that in mind, let's press on just a little bit further. The ideal Tao, then, is counterfactual. It's hypothetical. There are no actual ideal Tao's. Actual Tao's refer to how Tao's, Tao's that Tao in spite of interference, in response to interference. Tao's that, so every actual Tao in the universe Tao's in spite of interference. Now, some Tao's obviously Tao better than others in the sense that some Tao's persist longer than other Tao's. So, for instance, um, the uh, sequoia trees change very slowly. You can't really watch them grow. Uh, the, the Parthenon has been around for a million years, or, you know, the, the David has been around for 500 years. So these are things that are uh, have that kind of persistence, right? On the other hand, there are artificial elements that have been manufactured in laboratories that are, exist for only maybe even microseconds before they annihilate themselves again. So some DAOs can't even exist for more than a, a millisecond, and some DAOs persist for thousands of years. So the question is, what? how can we account for the differences in that kind of persistence? And the answer is tolerance, the word tolerance. That is to say, different DAOs exhibit different degrees of tolerance. And when I use the word tolerance here, I'm not saying let's all hold hands and sing Kumbaya. I'm saying, I'm referring to it in a structural sense, in a structural or architectural sense, in which case tolerance refers to the ability of a structure to withstand stress without losing its structural integrity, at which point it would fall down. So, for instance, the Empire State Building is built to sway two feet in each direction because, as the Tao Te Ching says, that which does not bend will break. That's to say, it has to be able to yield to a certain amount of pressure in order to remain upright. If every Tao, so the question is, if every Tao interferes with every other Tao, wouldn't the universe be better with fewer Tao's in it? Wouldn't the pen-only universe be a better one because a perfect Tao had been achieved? Well, that's if your goal is a perfect Tao. On the other hand, you could also say that the universe would be better if more DAOs operated more efficiently and interfered less with other DAOs, which I think is totally within our control. So, um, again, the kind of pen-only universe might be um, some kind of abstract dream of yours there, Chris, but I'm not sure it's a better universe, and certainly it's not a feasible universe. So the question is how do we make the actual universe better and the answer is by dowering more ideally, and we'll continue to move in that direction here as we proceed, which we're going to do now. So, um, in that sense, again, ideal dows are perfect, asymptotic, and normative, but not actual. There's no actual dows in the real world. Actual dows are how dows operate in spite of interference, uh, and some dows are more optimal than others. And it's because they're able to manage their stress. And again, the Empire State Building was able to manage a huge amount of stress, is able to manage a huge amount of stress. The World Trade Centers were built with even more tolerance, but not enough to handle the, the impact and the fact that that impact exceeded its tolerance limits, violated its structural integrity, and so, of course, they collapsed. So... That's what we mean by tolerance in this case. The ability to yield, the ability to withstand stress without collapsing. And what's interesting and ironic to me is that in many translations of the Tao Te Ching, 
This kind of yielding flexibility, this pliancy, is which in, in the Chinese term is usually rendered as raw, which means which is actually two blades of grass, which means kind of flowing or soft or pliant. Often that term is translated as weakness, which is really weird to me because it's so obvious that in this text that pliancy is a strength rather than a weakness. But um, so in that sense, then there are actual Tao's and actual Tao's actually Tao, but there are no ideal Tao's in the universe. And that is how I am going to read the first line of the Tao Te Ching, and that's where we're going to go next, but I do think we have another question here. How does one da differentiate one Tao from another if they're always interfering? How do you know where the boundaries between Tao's lie? And that's a great question. Uh, in fact, there is no sharp line between Tao's. Tao's overlap with one another, and yet I am more me than I am you, and you are more you than you are me, because I am more uh, influenced by, I am less interfered with by you than I am by myself. In other words, uh, I can say that I am more me than I am you than, than you are me, but, um, but I can't say that I'm entirely and exclusively me. Every, if everything's in process, everything does overlap. But think about, for instance, weather patterns on the weather map, or think about the Gulf Stream. We can track the Gulf Stream, even though the, it's not like there's a sharp wall between the water inside and outside the Gulf Stream. It's just a temperature gradient, and at some point we call it warm enough that it's part of the Gulf Stream, and at some point we call it cold enough that it's not. So at some point, it, it's, it's not me anymore, and we'll call it you, but you and I definitely overlap in that sense. All things overlap. And I don't think it's that hard to know where the boundaries are between Tao's under ordinary circumstances. At least the ostensible boundaries, not boundaries, but interfaces or, uh, or locuses. Uh, it's hard to be able to find a word for where those things shade into one another. But that's how it is. And so if you can imagine a rainbow, the colors all blur into one another, but you can still tell the colors apart. Anyway. So far, so good. So, any? let me just stop for a second and ask if there are any other problems or questions? Uh, anything coming up? Yeah? Okay, well, we have a question from our interlocutor here. Oh, which is, does the end of an object, Dowing as we know it, mean that the Tao no longer exists? No. I, I wouldn't, well, there, I have a problem with the way the question is asked, no offense, but it doesn't mean that the Tao and you spelled it with a capital D, no longer exists. What, to say that things, in an ontological sense, we would say things cease to exist. In a process sense, we would say that they, they turn into other processes. So if, if I have a table, it's proceeding in a table-like fashion, and I stand on it, it continues, because it, I'm within its tolerance limits, it continues to table in a table-like fashion, eventually it will de decompose and stop tabling in a table-like fashion, at which point it will become sawdust or something like, it will start sawdusting or something like that. But if I put an elephant or a Humvee on it now, it will very rapidly and quickly turn into some other processing, so it's splintering or toothpicking or whatever it is. So processes change. So like here in, in Newark, Delaware, we have one road, Route 896, and for a certain amount of time, it's Newcastle. It's it's I think it's uh, New London Road, and then it's Nottingham Road, or it's it's uh, New uh, it's uh, Main Street for a certain amount of time. I mean, it keeps changing what street it is, but it's always 896. It always kind of goes through that. So we can always talk about the um, changes as though uh, they're, uh, they're happening constantly. So it's not that things come into existence or cease to be. It's that processes form and deform. Processes turn into certain processes and then turn into other processes. There's a very famous story, well, in the Zhuangzi about um, this guy Zhuangzi who um, he lives in Confucian China where if your wife dies, you go into mourning for three years. You lock yourself in a room, people give you food, you don't see anybody. Sounds a little bit familiar, doesn't it? 
Anyway, um, the idea is that uh, Confucius, his wife dies, and his friend comes to pay his respects and finds Confucius the day after the funeral sitting on the floor in the kitchen banging on pots and pans and singing body songs. And his friend goes, what's wrong with you? Are you insane? Your wife just died. You need to, you should be mourning. And he said, well, you know, at first I was upset. And then I realized before she was my wife, she was something else. And then for a while she was my wife and now she's something else. So I'll sit on the floor and bang on pots and pans. So again, the idea is that things don't come into existence and cease to exist in the process view. They compress, they become concrete, and then they dissipate. They take shape and dissipate, as pretty much, like clouds, pretty much how it is. Okay, how are we doing? Good? All right. Then what I want to do is compare two readings of the first line of the first chapter of the Tao Te Ching. And I have this on the, the handout here, which again is the link to the handout, if you join us late, is somewhere on this YouTube page. You should be able to track it down uh, on the description. Uh, and, um, question? Question. Does that apply to humans as well? Yeah, absolutely, sure. That's what, that's what Zhuangzi's story is all about. I mean, let's face it, you're gonna be fertilizer someday. No offense, Chris. Uh, anyway, so, um, so am I. I'm probably sooner than you, I hope, anyway. Nobody's hoping anything here, but I hope I'm sooner than you. But that's what it means, you know, to, to complete, just to, to change. Uh, you know, we formed out of something, and we're going to end up informing something. And that's how, that's how the world works, at least in this process sense. Okay? Okay. So, if you refer to the handout, then I have the, in the character glossary all the characters in the first line of the first chapter of the Tao Te Ching. And then below that, I have a representative ontological reading, and I have my own process reading. Okay? So, the way it actually, and I do think I also, there's another, uh, I'll maybe I, I'll have to, post another handout, but there, but the fact is, the first line of the text reads, Dao Ke Dao, Fei Chang Dao, and again, Dao Ke Dao, the same word as the first one, Dao, second character Ke, back to the first character Dao, Fei Chang Dao, okay, that's the whole first line of the text, six characters, Dao Ke Dao, Fei Chang Dao. Now, again, there's no nouns or verbs here. So generally speaking, when the word shows up twice in a sentence like that, it's probably being used in one sense one time and in the other sense the other time. So generally speaking, people see the first usage as more or less nominal as a noun sense, and the second one as a verb sense, especially since the second one is ke dao, can dao, right? And if it can dao, then that suggests that that daoing is more of a verbal sense than a nominal sense. So literally what that line says is dao's can dao, that, those first three characters. The next three characters say fei chang dao. Now, fei is a negation. It means there are none, there is not, or whatever. Chong is the really challenging term here. Because it is almost always, you open up almost any translation of the Tao Te Ching, and Chong will be translated as eternal. And I, I don't understand that at all. Eternal is a concept of timelessness. In other words, eternality involves out something that's outside of time entirely. And again, time being a measurement of change, then to be eternal is to be unchanging. That's this static, monolithic, fundamentally real Tao that we see capitalized and definitely, definitely articled in the ontological reading. Here we see Tao's can Tao, but there and no matter how you read Chang, 
what it really says here is there are no constant there are no Chang Daos. Now, in fact, that's not how the representative ontological reading puts it. It suggests that there is an eternal Tao, but the Tao's that can be spoken of are just not it. And again, it doesn't say the Tao that can be spoken of. It says the Tao that can Tao. And grammatically, it's impossible to read those three characters, Tao Ke Tao, as the Tao that can be spoken of, or that could be Taoed, that could be Taoed of. Because that's a passive sense. It's Tao's can Tao, but this, this phrase can mean that, or it could re refer to Tao's that can Tao. But there's no way those three characters syntactically can mean Tao's that can be Taoed. There's no way that passive sense is sustained here. And a number of gra grammarians have pointed that out about this text, but still the philosophers and metaphysicians insist on reading it another way. Do I sound bitter? I'm sorry. Okay. So, Tao's can Tao. There are no Chang Tao's. Now, the word Chang, you, you will never find a single Chinese dictionary, modern or ancient, that translates Chang as eternal. It means often common, usual, consistent, ordinary, things like that. It would never mean eternal, aside from the fact that that concept doesn't even exist in late Joe Warring States China. It doesn't, doesn't even show up at all. So, Dao, so, in fact then, the way I'm reading this line, the first Tao refers to actual Daos. Daos actually Dao. But there are no Chang Daos. Now, what does Chang mean? Chang means continuous, constant, uninterrupted. So that uninterrupted Dao, that's what I've translated as the ideal Dao. Does that make sense? That the ideal Dao is the uninterrupted, the uninterfered with, the unobstructed Dao. So Daos can Dao. But this specifically says there are no ideal Daos. Actual Daos actually Dao. But there are no ideal Daos. And I think that that is just so interesting because the, the conventional reading just turns that completely on its head. It defies the grammar. It defies the vocabulary. And I think all because of an equivocation. I think that the German idealists who first encountered this stuff did not understand that Tao in the ideal sense is different than the ideal in the actual sense, and that they didn't get, what they didn't get is that in this text, the real Tao is the actual Tao, because the German idealists and the metaphysicians of the time, the real is the eternal, the abstract. Ever since Plato in the Greek tradition, the, the ultimately real is the abstract, and that's true in Advaita Vedanta too. So in this model, it's in fact the concrete that's the real, not the abstract. The ideal, then, is the abstract possibility of a perfect Tao, but actual Tao's are actual things that actually Tao in the world in spite of interference, which means eventually they'll all be worn down. And the Tao Te Ching says that too. Eventually Tao wears down all the sharp edges softens all the, 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 the wrinkles and reduces everything to dust. In the end, everything gets worn down because everything is rubbing up against everything all the time. So the goal in this model is not to make things last forever. The goal is to make things last as long as they optimally can by not over-interfering with other things. If we, if we operate most efficiently, which in the Chinese concept is Wei Ru Wei, if we act without interf maximally interfering with other Tao's, then we will be allowed to proceed in our best fashion as well. We will be able to Tao in our most ideal fashion. Because again, whenever we push on anything, interference is a two-way street. If I push on the world, the world pushes back. And the world is so much bigger than I am, it's going to run right over me. So we want to push as little as possible on the world because the, in order to avoid the world pushing back on us. The less we interfere with the world around us, the less the world around us is going to interfere with us. So this is not about ending interference. 
but this is about optimizing our function within the limits of that interference and maybe even using that interference to our advantage like hooking up a sail so that it'll catch the wind to take the boat where you want to go or or rowing with the current rather than against the current there's ways to use this to our advantage but only to the extent that we don't go counter to the way that we don't interfere as much as possible with the way things would naturally normally ordinarily turn out so if we come back to the character reading there what i've said is dao could dao fei chong dao does not mean the Tao that can be spoken of is not the eternal Tao. And the only way you can, I think, arrive at that is if you want to start from the assumption that there is an eternal Tao. I think there are other places in the Tao Te Ching where a reference to something, some vague amorphous thing exists or something that existed before the world. I think if you look closely at those chapters, they always contain a lot of terms that indicate metaphor or simile. So in other words, the, it, the chapter will read something like, rather than saying, there was something there before time, it will, the, answer, the text will say something like, it will, it's as if it were there before time, or it seems as though it were the ancestor of all things. But it's always that kind of metaphorical language where these are like similes or parables or ways of talking about something. And again, rather than suggesting that it really is that, I think the text consistently goes to the trouble of emphasizing that it's as though it were like that. And I think that's a, that's a really big difference. Uh, so, <clears throat> I think at that point, I am going to slow down and see if there are any questions uh, or problems that we can answer at this point. Because, um, I mean, I can keep going forever. But I, I don't. Want, I think I've done enough damage. So let me see if any questions pop. Or, or are there other questions from before that I need to get to? Yeah. Um, we had uh, Andrea DeMaio say, speaking of French at the beginning, uh, Bonjour, Monsieur. Uh, Bonjour, Monsieur. Uh, Bonjour, Monsieur. Uh, she said, I have read Sure. So, speaking of French, Andrea just started a reread of Creative Evolution by Henri Bergson, uh, and she's looking forward to learning more about some potential parallels with his ideas of duration and Elan Vital, the, the vital life, or the, the whatever, however he translates that. But um, I have read some Bergson. I haven't read Creative Evolution, but I do think you're probably going to find a fair amount of overlap, because I'm pretty sure Bergson also is familiar with with this kind of material. And also, by the way, this process reading that I'm championing here in terms of uh, Taoist tradition uh, is also found in um, Alfred North Wadeshead's process philosophy. And so let me just also emphasize also on the hand that I have some suggested readings here. I have uh, two translations, well, three translations of the Tao Te Ching on here. One, which I would argue is probably the most um, uh, ontological is the one by John Wu. That's a very ontological reading. It's a very beautiful poetic reading, but it's also a good example of what I mean by the ontological reading. Uh, I also have included Roger Ames and David Hall's translation, which was the first translation that tried to go, I think, in a process direction. I don't think it consistently does that, but it is in the direction that we're heading here. And then I also included uh, uh, Jonathan Starr's translation, because he, it's not so much for his translation, but he has at the back of his book uh, a lot of great apparatus characters and the, for the, all the chapters and all the glossary and stuff like that. So if you ever wanted to try to slog through it in Chinese, that would be a really helpful text to use. I will say that the reason I learned Chinese was to read the Tao Te Ching, and that's how I learned to read Chinese, was by going through and looking up every character and looking it up again and again and again, and then just eventually in trying to compare it with a billion translations and eventually getting the hang of it. So um, that's not impossible to do. Uh, I also included um, not Whitehead's Process and Reality, which is this, what I think is a magnificent tome, but I, I know a lot of people disagree with me on that. They think it's just nuts. Um, and I've read it twice now, and I'm almost certainly going to have to slog through it again. 
But I did not include that on here because it is a slog. But I did include Sherburn's uh, key to Whitehead's process and reality, which is kind of a guide to the text. It might be a little easier to read. But as far as I'm concerned, Whitehead invents all the language that we're using here to describe a process metaphysics. Um, and it's, it's just fascinating to me. It's just a, an incredib incredibly visionary work. Uh, the Sherburn's work is not a masterpiece, but it um, helps you make sense of a very challenging masterpiece. So, uh, let's see. Any other questions or problems? Uh, so, so, what about strong forces like gravity that seemingly can't be interfered with at all? Is gravity an ideal Tao? I, I don't, I, gravity is not really even a Tao, I think. Um, gravity is the fact that, I mean, the way I understand gravity, uh, the way um, I understand it from Einstein's general relativity theory, is that it's, it's not a Tao, it's a curvature. It's, a, it's, a, it's, um, it's the shape of Tao's. Um, it refers to the fact that massive objects, Tao's, have an impact on other DAOs. So the impact that DAOs have on other DAOs is gravity in some sense or another, either attractive or repellent. So massive objects, for instance, tend to attract other objects. Uh, and the, the more massive object tends to attract the less massive object. So I'm not sure I would call gravity a, a DAO. Um, and I, I'm not even sure I would call forces gravitational forces, DAOs, I would say that they are more like the kinds of principles or laws that govern how DAOs DAO. And I think that all DAOs are informed, all processes are informed by a variety of principles, some of which are extremely idiosyncratic. So this processing here, Alaning, is informed by some information, some principles that are unique to me, like my DNA. On the other hand, I'm also a human being, so all the principles that pertain to, that inform human beings also inform me. Uh, I'm also a thing, so the laws of physics also inform me. So I think that all DAOs are influenced by or informed by a wide variety of principles, and um, I think that the principles of, of determine how DAOs DAO, but the principles themselves are not DAOs. And that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. And I think I got to the Whitehead. So Taoist yogic practices, oh boy. Well, Taoist yoga practices, depends on what you mean by Taoist yoga practice. I think, uh, if the question is, how do Taoist yoga practices relate back to Wei Wu Wei, or Taoing ideally? Um, <clears throat> It depends on what you mean by Taoist yoga practices. If if you're talking about like qigong, uh, then absolutely qigong uh, is based on the principle of, of tai chi. We want, because again, the idea is that we're we're losing qi, and the practice of qigong enables us to use qi more efficiently, to not waste as much energy. And I think that's a perfect example of wei wu wei. We're not struggling against the world. So we're not losing energy. We're not venting energy through anxiety and stress, if that makes any sense. Um, so I, I, Qigong is definitely, I think, especially, and, 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 and that, that's even more vivid when you look at certain practical applications of Qigong with Taiji boxing. Uh, in Taiji boxing, it is Wei Wu Wei. I use Taiji boxing as an example of Wei Wu Wei. Force comes in. If you meet the force head on, there's impact. But if you allow the force to expend itself without impact, Tai Chi, the, yin, the yang turns into yin, goes back on itself, and all the practitioner has to do is step in and touch somebody, add a, a single ounce of energy, and literally throw them across the room. So the idea is to learn how to avoid that practice, to avoid that force, yield to it, and allow it to go back on itself. And that yielding and allowing it to go back on itself, that's way Wu Wei, not interfering. I can stick my face in front of the guy's fist, but that's kind of interfering. And I'd rather not do that. I'd rather not interfere with the guy's fist, if that makes sense. Uh, ideal DAOs are culturally influenced. Uh, the, um, I, that's a question. So, um, so if I, I think that when you talk about ideal DAOs in general, I don't think that's culturally influenced. Yeah, the question is, um, 
uh, would you say that ideal DAOs are culturally influenced? For example, if I'm a Westerner, I'm going to read my ideal ability to to be myself as different to than someone in some other country. Uh, so I think that the concept of the ideal DAO, the concept of the most op of the effortless, the the most optimal DAO, at least the, the the best outcome for your life, that is just universal. What your culture tells you is acceptable as an outcome of your life, I think, is not what is ideal for your life. Uh, again, um, I, I think it, it's a shame if you think of your ability to be you as, as different as someone in some other country, because that means that it's, it's something's interfering with your actual destiny. It means that something's preventing you from dowing in your most ideal fashion. It's cultural peer pressure or you know, views of what constitutes success or, you know, whatever it is, are preventing you from seeing what would be best for you. Now, obviously, also, as you contemplate the possibilities for how your Tao can be at manifested in the world, your destiny can be played out, you're limited by the possibilities you're exposed to, which is why, obviously, it's so much better to raise kids with a, a broad encyclopedic range of experience ideally because then they'll be able to see all the different kinds of ways they could dow um, and then the more ways we can see how to dow the more likely we are to find the best way to dow and so um, I, I again I do think that there are cultural influences here but I think that's kind of unfortunate um, as far as Confucian da so Justin is asking is it too soon to get into Confucian Taoist comparisons and differences Specifically, how do you think Confucian order and Taoist harmony jive with each other? Well, uh, I can say this at this point, because we've talked enough about both things to be able to say this, I think, which is that uh, I think there's a, a point of, of contact here between Taoism and Confucianism, is that in both cases, I think what they're talking about is learning how to fit in, learning how to adapt to the environment, learning how to be... Uh, non-obstructive. I mean, that's what adaptation is, is learning how to uh, cooperate with the environment in a way that's at least mutually somewhat beneficial, right? Um, I do think the difference there is the scope of the adaptation, so that I think in Confucianism, what we, what we want to adapt to is society. What we, we want to fit into society, so the so we want to learn how to be the ideal citizen, the ideal member of a, of, a, of, a, of a social network. Whereas in Taoism, it's about fitting into the universe as a whole. So I think the ideal Taoist person, the ideal Confucian would be perfectly comfortable at a, at a, at a dinner party or at, a, at a, a gala or a birthday party or anything that's part of conventional society they would know exactly what to do uh, in a formal situation. But they're not going to be, they're not going to know what to do if you put them out in the middle of nature, right? Because none of those social structures are, ad, uh, are adaptive or ad, advantageous out there. Whereas a Taoist, I, I, the way I look at it, would be perfectly comfortable in, at, a, at, a, at a fancy dinner, but also perfectly comfortable sitting around a campfire, banging on a guitar with it, you know, having a jamboree. Uh, so, you know, banging on pots and pans. So I, I do think that um, the, the scope is different, but they're both about, so when you talk about order and harmony, and that's how I'm answering this, is that it, in Confucianism, that need to fit in manifests as order, because it's a social order. In the Taoist context, I think it manifests as harmony, because it's more about just the, the fitting in, As and Zhuangzi even talks about what we would maybe in English call the music of the spheres, the different pipings of, of the world as Taoists move and create music that they all kind of cooperate with each other instead of struggling with each other. And uh, I think even in Confucianism, the goal is to make everything move, make, operate effortlessly, but only within a social context are we able to do that. Uh, is Confucianism really interested in doing that? So, next question. If we should attempt to interfere with other DAOs as little as possible, that's better. How would one create change in the world around them? Specifically, how would one beget societal change and advancement? Well, that's a good question, and my answer comes from my Taiji training. 
You do it by working with people, not by punching them in the nose, not by confronting, but by cooperating. And I know that sounds simplistic, maybe, or pie in the sky, but I definitely think the alternative is violence. The alternative is just going to make things worse. So somehow or another, you got to find a way to work around people, to bring them over to your side. One way, one book I would definitely read that's based on these principles that has been applied to everything from warfare to business and management is The Art of War by Sun Tzu, where he applies these very principles to warfare. You can't, if you can't, you don't, you never face the enemy head on. You always try to surround them or head them off or cut them off or something, but you never want to just go at somebody head on. Especially, Sun Tzu says, you need to have spies. Spies are a big part of the project here. All right, so uh, Justin Jones, and this does relate to my interest in putting shopping carts back into their stalls. Okay, somebody's got a pet peeve. Uh, okay, other problems or questions? Any other problems or questions? Maybe not. Okay, so while I'm waiting for a couple of questions to add up, or if they don't, that's fine. But we do want to remind you about the donation link, which is also in the description down below. And again, remember, we are not pressuring anybody to donate. You are absolutely welcome here, whether you donate or not. Uh, perfectly happy to have everybody here. The more, the merrier. This is a great fun, I think. It's just great to exercise our minds in this fashion and be part of a community. Uh, but if you do want to contribute, again, there are a lot of people in need. And um, if you are in a position to help those in need, that would be a great thing to do. And you don't have to donate through our site here. You can just send directly to sites or to some other site if you want to just be helpful. Or donate your time. Uh, that's also a good way to do it because, um, again, we're all looking out for each other a little bit here. So, running out of steam. So, um, well, maybe I did blow people's minds. Are you still there? Hello? Hello? Anyway, testing, testing. This thing on? Okay, so, so far we've raised $2,381 for the Food Bank of Delaware. So I think that's great. That's a lot of food. Thank you to all who donated. It's just great. And you can definitely feel good about yourselves. And you are endowing ideally, I think, when you do stuff like this. Um, so if... Oh, so teaser for next time. Yes. So next time I do want to talk about the texts themselves, the... The Tao Te Ching and the Zhuangzi are more particularly, and uh, we can, we'll talk a little bit about the history of the texts very briefly, but mostly what I want to do is to uh, take some chapters, do some readings together, and just explore some of the incredible wisdom in some of these stories. So I hope you can join us then. But now the phones are lighting up a little bit too, so um, let me just answer a couple more questions. Would the response be the same even in the face of violence? An army is about to conquer your kingdom unless you fight them, should you just surrender? Well, now that's a great question, and of course, it's just a matter of, these are judgment calls. There's no right and wrong answer in Taoism. It's not about morality, it's about effectiveness. So the question is, are, you know, if you're just going to be killed, well, I'm not sure. This isn't about non-violence. This is about non-interference. And sometimes you do have to interfere a little bit at the right time in order to avoid maximum interference later. Some of the older people in the group remember, but back in the 70s, there was this back to nature movement in Philadelphia called MOVE. And they bought all these houses uh, side by side, row houses in, in uh, West Philly, and they were building tunnels between them and fortifying them. And this was a militant anti uh, civilization group or something. I, don't, I may be misrepresenting them, but this is, my point is going to be made whether I'm adequately representing the, the organization or not. But they were building these things and fortifying everything for the longest time. Neighbors were complaining to the city and the city didn't do anything about it. And finally, all these fortifications are complete. And yeah, Wilson Good in the 70s. And uh, all these fortifications were complete. And um, the city comes knocking on the door and says, you got to take it all down. Push comes to shove, there's armed violence, the city drops a bomb on the house, 60 houses go up in flames. So the fact is, I'm not saying there was a way to avoid conflict in that case, but if we had acted, well, if the mayor, Wilson Good, 
had acted at the right time, and again, I'm probably oversimplifying the situation dramatically, but as far as my example is concerned, if the mayor had acted at the right time, sure, there might have been some conflict, but they wouldn't have burned down 60 houses, which the city then had to rebuild, which then they had to rebuild again because they all collapsed into a, a soggy marsh. So, I mean, to talk about overdoing it and getting to the point where it's just counterproductive. So I do think there's room to intervene. There are places and times to intervene, but you do want to be strategic. You do want to be careful and precise so that you don't over intervene because then, boom, it, it's counterproductive. Anyway, just read in the comments. Problems, questions, thoughts? Okay, so next time we will talk about the two texts, the Tao Te Ching and the Zhuangzi. And uh, I will send out another handout with a few, maybe a few readings on there that you can follow along the bouncing ball. Uh, please, I do want to emphasize again how grateful I am to um, uh, the uh, incredible team I have supporting me. My daughters, who are my technical and uh, every other kind of support. Um, oh no, Sierra. Oh no. <laughs> I doubt we could find a better virtual audience. Oh, no. Oh, no. I'm so glad your name is on that and not mine. <laughs> the name of the second book uh, is probably, you'll find it either as C-H-U-A-N-G-T-Z-U. Uh, actually, I can write it here in the chat here. It's either... It's pronounced Zhuangzi, whether you spell it with a Z or the C-H. It's pronounced Zhuangzi. But those are the two ways you'll find it in, tr in its translations. Can you spell it out loud again? Z-H-U-A-N-G-Z-I or C-H-U-A-N-G-T-Z-U. So... Uh, again, let me just say thank you to Sarah Fulton and Spur Impact for helping us with the donations. My daughters for doing everything. Uh, Kylie Whitman for the art and Crystal White also for the, our logo our, on the banner there. And so her website is also listed here. Everybody should check that out. And um, thanks to you all for coming and making this a worthwhile experience for me. And um, also for donating and just being part of a community. So uh, otherwise, I'll see you next week, 3 o'clock, same bat time, same bat channel. See you there. <laughs>